Very good afternoon and welcome to the national webinar on genital malignancy and breast cancer. The reason for selecting these topics are mainly this September and the October month is mainly for the awareness of the cancer. And we, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, has given more importance for genital cancer and breast cancer. September month is mainly for the awareness month of genital cancer and October month is mainly for awareness of breast cancer. So the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Father Mullah's Homeopathic Medical College plan to organize this national webinar on genital malignancies, including breast cancer. I being the HOD of the Department of OBG, along with Dr. Raisa Cherian, welcomes you all this webinar. We have three resource person for today's webinar presentation. The first resource person is highlighting the clinical diagnosis and main investigation. The second resource person is highlighting the experience in treating cancer patients. Third resource person is mainly highlighting the diagnosis, examination and investigation in breast cancer. Without wasting much time, I would like to introduce the first speaker of today's webinar, Professor Dr. Jose Norona. Sir graduated MBBS from Goa Medical College in the year 1976, affiliated to Bombay University with distinction and awarded two gold medals for obtaining highest marks in obstetrics and gynecology and for best graduate of the year. Sir graduated his MD in 1981 from Goa Medical College, affiliated to Mumbai University did senior residency in Goa Medical College for three years, teaching post. Worked as gynecologist in Directorate of Health Service for 18 years. Resource person for medical certification of death for last 10 years, along with the faculty from the Goa Medical College. Resource person in training programs, workshops, and refresher courses for government servants have many publications to his credit, presently working as visiting professor in Sri Kamakshi Devi Homeopathic Medical College from 2008. With this brief introduction, I welcome you, sir. Kindly take over the session. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam, for your introduction. Okay, I'm going to talk today on investigations for genital malignancies. Okay, can you all hear me? Everything is fine? Gynecological malignancy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Gynecological malignancy refers to five malignancies. One is cervical cancer. Second is ovarian cancer. Third one is vaginal cancer. Fourth one is vulval cancer. The last one is endometrial or uterine malignancy. Right? The investigation that we are going to do for these malignancies are in three headings. One is routine tests. Second will be hormonal assays and tumor markers. And third one are going to be specialized tests. The specialized tests are transvaginal ultrasound, abdominal and pelvic ultrasound, pap smear test, colposcopy, endometrial biopsy, fractional curettage, cervical biopsy, biopsy of vaginal or vulval lesion, hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, proctosigmoidoscopy, and cystoscopy imaging. Right? Now, Madam has given me 20-25 minutes, so I am going to skip the routine blood test. I will try to take something which is not well known, and I will not cover something which is very well known. Right? So these are the routine blood tests. From there, we go to tumor markers. Every day we say someone is having malignancy, has a tumor marker been done? So every day we say CA-125 is done, this is done, that is done. So what are these tumor markers? Tumor markers are soluble glycoproteins. They are found in the blood, urine, or tissues of patients 
who suffer from a cancerous process. The tumor markers which are elevated in ovarian cancer are cancer antigen 125, commonly known as CA125. Second, carcino embryonic antigen CEA. And third one, CA199. Now, CA125 is a useful first generation marker. It's also of predictive value for endometrial cancer. In, the other thing is that elevated levels of CA125 may be found in the serum, vaginal and cervical secretions for detection of precancerous lesions. Then comes the very common tumor that we find, ovarian cyst adenocarcinoma associated antigen. Lipid associated silic acid have been developed for ovarian cancer. Transforming growth factor for squamous cancer. Placental protein 4 for endometrial and cervical cancer. What are the tumor markers for cancer of the cervix? Cancer of the cervix is the second most common cancer that we see in India. Sometimes they say the cancer of the cervix is the highest cancer which is seen in India. That and the breast cancer come together. Fine. So squamous cell carcinoma antigen, SCCAG, is a serum marker for squamous cell carcinoma in clinical use. Then after treatment, the squamous cell carcinoma antigen level comes down if the treatment is successful. Also, the squamous cell carcinoma antigen can come up again in case of tumors recurrence. Then comes to our usual CA-125. It is also related to high disease stage. And CA-125 is the commonest tumor marker which is used in clinical practice. So cancer antigen CA-99 has a role in detection of tumor relapse. Last one is cytokeratin 19 fragment called CIFRA21-1 can be a useful prognostic marker for CA cervix. Then comes abdominal and pelvic ultrasound. Well, we all know what is an ultrasound. We all know sometimes we have one for an ultrasound. An abdominal pelvic ultrasound is done for imaging of the organs in the abdomen and pelvis. Now for an abdominal and pelvic ultrasound, the bladder should be full. Why should the bladder be full? Full bladder will push away bowel away from the field. It's called acoustic window. We always tell a patient, drink a lot of water, don't pass urine. If a full bladder is there, the full bladder will push away the bowel from the field. This is known as acoustic window. Consent, female attendant, privacy, etc. Right? Then comes transvaginal ultrasound. This is very commonly done because this is very, very accurate. An ultrasound probe is introduced in the vagina. We first put a condom over it. Over there, we put a jelly or a lubricant. The idea of jelly or lubricant, so the patient may not get pain. Right? So bladder full is not needed. You don't have to tell the patient, keep a full bladder. Now, it has a range of 8 to 10 centimeters. The transvaginal probe movements are, one is penetrating, when you push in the probe in the vagina, Second is rocking, anterior posterior movement. Third is sliding, lateral movement. Fourth is rotating, 45 to 90 degrees. So these are the movements which the sonologist does with his hands using a transvaginal probe to get a proper view which is seen on the, uh, on the screen. Right then, we go to the whatever topic I was supposed to take today, pap smear. Pap smear is something very common, except it is not so common in India because our Indian women are not willing to go for it. You have to convince them quite a lot. So many people say, I'm coming, coming, they never come. So what is that? It's a screening test based on exfoliative cytology. If the test is positive, we have to do other investigations like colposcopy, cervical biopsy, fractional curettage. In addition, an SPV test is done if the pap smear test comes positive for abnormal cells. But today, instead of calling the patient twice, we are doing dual testing. In dual testing, we do a pap smear and SPV test. Now, what is SPV test? In SPV test, 
we are looking for the genetic material or DNA of HPV within the squamous cell. So we see the DNA of HPV within the squamous cell. The PEP test can detect about 60 to 70 percent of cancer of the cervix, about 40 to 50 percent of endometrial carcinoma. The test aims to detect CIN, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or cervical dysplasia, which is caused by sexually transmitted human papilloma viruses. In fact, if you all know, if you all know, if you have done the basics, the cancer of the cervix comes because of an attack by HPV. Now, this is a nice diagram. You can see the infection by HPV on the stratified squamous epithelium of the ectocervix, the infected basal cell is seen right down there. Then after weeks, you get HPV in the epithelial cells. Right? So this is the start of CIN, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And after 10 to 30 years, you get invasive cancer. You get invasive cancer. In invasive cancer, the HPV DNA is integrated into the tumor cell DNA. Procedure one, to optimize collections, the woman should schedule an appointment about 10 to 18 days or two weeks after her LMP. Then no douche 48 hours prior to the test. No use of tampons, birth control foams, jellies, or other vaginal creams. Refrain from intercourse 48 hours prior to the test. Then, a PEP test will not be done when a lady is menstruating. Then, last thing is, PEP smear should be obtained prior to PV examination. Because when you do a PV examination, the fingers may take away the exfoliated cells. So finally, you may not get anything. So you should not do a PV examination. PV examination, if required, should be done last after taking the pap smear. Now, I'm sorry for the picture. Position, buttocks off the table, good lighting, drape, standby. Then inspect, spread the labia. Then you have to check for discharge, ulcers, and growth. Check for all these three. After that, this is the instrument that we are going to use. We used to call it Cusco's bivalve self-retaining speculum. Fine. Lubrication. Normally, we put sablon, we put some lubricants here. Lubrication is warm water. Not too hot. Lubricate speculum. Don't use any other thing like Vaseline, surgery tube, nothing else. Use only warm water. Then spread the labia. Keep the labia apart. Blades remain closed until the full insertion of the specula. Then comes squamocolumnar junction. This is a nice picture. What is squamocolumnar junction? Junction of the pink cervical skin and the endocervical canal. You see the pink cervical skin and the reddish endocervical canal. That is called the squamocolumnar junction. It is an unstable area. It is known as transitional zone. It is the area where the squamous epithelium has come out. Has come out because it has grown from the endocervix, from key portion of the cervix to sample, and the most likely site of dysplasia. Now this is a surface spatula. You must have seen it in your department. It has a concave end and a convex end. The concave end fits the cervix. The convex end is used to take vaginal pool scrapings and vaginal wall scrapings for hormonal study. The sample of the cervix. You put the concave in, rotate to 360 degrees. Don't use too much force. Patient will bleed. Don't use too little force. The, you will get inadequate sample. Then cytobrush. Insert this cytobrush. Inside the endocervical canal for at least for two centimeters, only rotate for 180 degrees. If you rotate more than 180 degrees, it will cause bleeding. Then get it on a slide as thin as possible and properly labeled. Fine. And spray with a fixative within 10 to 15 seconds. Don't allow the sample to get air dry. First, put the spray. The spray is on a cytospray. You can also use a hairspray. 
But then what I want to tell you is when I was training up and even now people use an equal amount of 95% alcohol and ether. There's a bottle called Pepsmere bottle. You have a mixture of ether and absolute alcohol. You can put the slide inside that particular bottle. Then after fixing for 30 minutes, the slide is air dried and stained with Papa Nicolau stain. So you have to dry the slide and stain with tap stain. Fine. Then we go to classification. Grade one is normal cytology. Grade two is inflammatory smear. Then comes mild dysplasia, moderate severe dysplasia, CN2, 3. And last one comes malignant cell. So this is a nice picture. You can see normal. You can see CIN1. You can see CIN2. You can see CIN3. Watch, watch the cytoplasm nucleus, the ratio, please. Then when and who to start screening? One, any woman with a cervix who has ever had sexual intercourse. In other words, guidelines say that you may not do a pap smear on a person who has never had sexual intercourse. Begin screening three years after the onset of sexual activity or at the age of 21, whichever comes first, right? Then young women who are infected with HIV or immunocompromised should have pap smears twice in the first year and then annually thereafter. And what about the remaining population? They say that you have to have an annual smear for three years. If the reports are normal, then you have one smear every three years. So have an annual smear for three years, then one smear every three years, right? Then uh, the risk factors that might justify annual screening are cervical neoplasia, known infection with HPV, other STDs and HIVs, high risk sexual behavior, chronic corticosteroids treatment. Then you should stop screening after the age of 65 to 70, provided the lady gives history of three negative smears done. Now, we all say that human papilloma virus is the cause of cancer of the cervix. But there are co-factors. Whenever these co-factors are on, you should see to it that the lady does her pap smear. One is active or passive cigarette smoking. The husband may be smoking, so he is an active smoker, but the wife may be inhaling the smoke. So she becomes a passive smoker, right? The chronic inflammation associated with other STDs, long-term use of oral contraceptives, multiparity, weakened immune system, multiple sex partners, sex at an early age, nutritional deficiencies, mother who took DES. Nowadays, DES is diethyl silvestrol, estrogen. Nowadays, it is not given. Huh? We have little more. Colposcopy is a diagnostic procedure to examine a magnified view of the cervix, as well as of the vagina and vulva in case any lesions are there. Now, this is the colposcope. This is a nice picture of a colposcope. Fine. Now, acetic acid iodine applied to the cervix. What happens is you put a speculum, you see the cervix. Areas of the cervix that turn white after the application of acetic acid or have an abnormal vascular pattern are often considered for biopsy. Now, what does the acetic acid do? Acetic acid removes the mucus and allows the abnormal areas to be seen more easily with the help of a composition. Now, areas which turn white after the application of acetic acid are known as acetovite epithelium. Right? Now, they say that if you apply acetic acid to a place that uh, there is CIN3 or cancer of the cervix, that area becomes completely opaque and white because of a higher incident or concentration of abnormal nuclear protein. CIN3 and CS cervix have a lot of nuclear protein. So that area becomes completely white. And if no uh, uh, lesions are visible, you can apply iodine. Iodine stains the squamous, normal squamous epithelium, mahogany brown. So that the other area is abnormal from where you can take a biopsy.
Now the colposcopies use a score. A score less than five does not require biopsy because the low risk of cancer. A score of five to seven requires a biopsy. A score more than eight does not require biopsy but requires direct surgery. So people do a score whenever a colposcope is done. The colposcope gives the clinician a score. Based on the score, the clinician decides what to do next. Next is endometrial biopsy or curettage. We all know about it. DNC biopsy. We can also do it by a Vavra aspirator. Cervical biopsy. You take a punch biopsy. With a punch biopsy, forceps. You can put a Ellis, take a wedge biopsy. But whenever you do that, you should see that you take the squamo columnar junction. Right? Then the next last one is colonization, cone biopsy around the squamo columnar junction with the effects of the cone towards the internal loss. All this will tell you if there is a cancerous process inside. Now, a little time is remaining. Just laparoscopy. We all know what is laparoscopy. We do imaging of the organs inside. Fine. This is all laparoscopy. This is how we do laparoscopy. Fine. This is the ovarian tumor seen by laparoscope. This is hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is the process of viewing and operating the endometrial cavity from a trans cervical approach. You connect it to a camera on a monitor, you can see everything. Fine. This is how hysteroscopy is done. Then proctosigmoidoscopy and cystoscopy, what happens many times, uh, the, there can be infiltration of the rectum, rectum, sigmoid, you do proctosigmoidoscopy in CA cervix stage 4 or in the cancer of the vagina, you can have infiltration of the bladder, so you do cystoscopy. Then imaging test, CT scan, we all know what is a CT scan, we do a bone scan for secondaries in the bone, we do MRI, we do P PET scan, positron emission tomography scan. We go to see there are secondaries anywhere in the body. The whole body can be imaged by doing a PET scan. Right? The last one is X-ray chest PA. Right? Thank you very much. This is the image of our college. I thank you. I thank you, Dr. Vilma. I thank you, the faculty of Father Muller, for giving me a chance to interact with you. I'm sorry I went a little fast, but I had to finish it in record time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. And now we have the second speaker of today's webinar is Dr. Kiran S. Kamal. He's BHMS MD and presently working as a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Enopaya Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital, Mangalore. Madam has completed 17 years of teaching experience and 23 years of professional experience. Previously, Madam was working in Bharatesh Homeopathic Medical College and Alvas Medical College. Madam has, was a resource person for various seminars and CMEs. Madam, I request you to kindly take over the session. Thank you, madam. And I hope I'm audible to everybody. Yes, ma'am. You're audible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'll go ahead now. Thank you, Vilma, ma'am, for the small, but uh, I feel so. For me, it's a detailed introduction what you have given. And without going ahead with the, all the other basic things, today I'm here just to share a few of my experiences in relation to the genital malignancies. And here I go ahead with my first case. Now this is a case which I had received around uh, four years back. Um, and this patient <coughs> who was 65 years of age at the time when she had first approached me, she was a retired school teacher. And she had come basically for the recurrent vaginal foul smelling blood stain discharges and along with that there was a complaint of low backache. Basically she was a known case of CA endometrium stage 2 since 4 months and already this patient had undergone two months of uh, two rounds of chemotherapy. 
now she was actually supposed to go ahead for the third month uh, third cycle of the chemotherapy but because of the fear of metastasis of surgery as because she was asked for hysterectomy that fear of metastasis and death which she had heard it from many of her friends as well as from her uh, neighbors and all so that fear was the basic thing which made her to visit a homeopath and unexpectedly like for me it was uh, like she was the new patient to me when she had come basically she was being made to contact me through one of her student her old student who was my patient at that time and hence she came in contact with me and it was a good experience for me to go ahead with this case her menstrual history has revealed that she used to usually have her delayed menses and heavy menses which was started from her first delivery this problem was not there before her first delivery and at 53 years of age that is 12 years prior to this case when she reported she had already attained menopause so basically now the important thing is she had got two children she has two children but these two children she got it only after indu uh, induction of ovulation she had difficulty in conceiving and <coughs> both the times she has undergone induction of ovulation with um, modern medications as such there was no obvious family history about the malignancy in any way related to the female genital system or even with her father or brother also if at all just with uh, anxiety and uh, curiousness we had asked up whether there was any other malignancies but nothing was been found out mentally this patient had shown too much of anxiety about the future because when the whole session when the interrogation was being done it was observed about her anxiety level the method of how she was explaining and her expressions could show the anxiety and basically the anxiety was based, uh, related about who will take care about her children because that fear of death what was there later had she also sh uh, shared her thoughts that she uh, constantly keeps on praying the only thing is that her death be delayed she knows that her, the, her death is inevitable but she is to always say that let the death be delayed until their children settled with a very good job though they were grown up they are already in the job she still wanted something better to happen and that was the only thing what was been observed and the other important thing like she was always very much uh, like dependent on her husband not much with her children but more with her husband like uh, because might be at this age which is a common part for every female who keeps on having their bonding more with the husband that could be one research we found out we didn't take extraordinary condition point has been put up is Uh, i said uh, as i said just now about her uh, love and care about the student and because of her love and care what she had given it to her old students and her love for her old students itself was the reason for how this patient had come to me and, and that is only because one of her student who was my patient she had made this person this patient come to me because this lady the patient uh, her student who was my patient was also under my treatment since many months together and that was how this like we could just realize about the affection conditions of this patient basically the first point because she was a known case of ca endometrium then there was no need of going ahead for once again the detailed investigations to be started right from the beginning so we had to continue from whatever we ha already have it and when we checked up her weight and height was comparatively okay though compared to her height <coughs> the weight was slightly excess but didn't feel it too much alarming as such when we speak with malignancies the weight usually reduces which was not found in this patient the important finding is about the tenderness in the left iliac fossa and the abdomen slightly bloated a doubt about whether it was only the bulky uterus or a tumor within the uterus both the ways we were doubting the other important finding is about the full brownish discharge which was constantly oozing from the cervix just on examination on pv examination this was been observed and the uterus was felt to be bulky corresponding to around 10 weeks of pregnancy size the other important finding what we got up is she had a, uh, created a strong aversion for the non vegetarian food basically she was a vegetarian patient 
a non vegetarian person but now since two months that aversion of that food or the total of the non vegetarian types any dishes that aversion had been started and it has gradually progressed it is not that it came up all of a sudden and it is there as it is it gradually pro uh, pro uh, progressed and that aversion even to the smell and the sight also has been increased in our generals if at all we speak up bowel was soft but she used to pass she gave a very typical point is she passed on the bowels only once in 3 days without any pain no hardness of the bowels whether it was a habitual condition what she had created for herself or whether it had occurred on its own nothing could be elicited on this point but because there was no pain and there was no hardness she has never gone for any treatment for this particular point and this was been since since ages together that because it was right from her college days what she was experiencing this bowel habits and the sleep as it is a routine part for any of the malignant patients here also we have seen that the sleep was disturbed only because of her anxiety and worries on considering the totality it was been observed that <coughs> the remedy so there were uh, calcarea cup and along with that even kali cup was also been seen but calcarea cup was been selected because it is not only on repetition but also on the totality of the symptoms and hence calcarea cup 200 one dose was been given on the first day along with that hydrast test has been started as it is related because of the typical action of hydrast test related to the uterine discharges and after 5 days the observation what was seen is there is no change in the quantity of discharges and offensiveness has been reduced no offensiveness that means the that offensive discharges that foul smelling discharges have been reduced but the quantity of discharges has not been changed and hence only hydrastis was been continued and the patient was asked to come back after 5 to 8 days in the second follow up it was been observed that the quantity of the discharges also has been reduced and the offensiveness has completely gone off the other change what was been observed is the lower abdominal pain what this lady was having has been reduced in its intensity and the frequency so the calcarea cup same medicine with the same potency was repeated along with hydrastis for 8 days in the third follow up then we could see that there was a better change in the first follow up and the second it was not much of changes been observed but in the third follow up we could see a better change because the abdominal pain was noticed only once since 8 days of gap in that gap only once this patient had got the abdominal pain and she didn't go for any local medications also not even a hot water bag or hot fermentation what she used to routinely get it done but now this was the time for her third chemotherapy as been informed by her oncologist the only thing is because of sheer uh, the fear she was not willing to go ahead for the chemotherapy only that fear of chemotherapy will kill me that was the constant statement what this patient used to give and only for that reason she was trying to postpone the chemotherapy she was trying to delay the chemotherapy later carcinosin was been added up as a intercurrent medicine along with hydrastis now been increased in its potency and on the fourth follow up because before the fourth follow up itself she had got her usg done and which had shown the endometrial thickening of 5 mm as such routinely a postmenopausal female gives uh, shows the endometrial thickening of not more than 3 mm that's a routine condition but now in cases of malignancies it may go even up to 8 mm ca endometrium and the other important finding what comes up in transvaginal sonography is the endometrial thickening will not be uniform and smooth always there will be irregularities but in this patient though the endometrial thickening was 5 mm there was no irregularities in the surface lining and just because that surface lining that irregularity was not much that was the only possibility might be which made the oncologist and the gynecologist to postpone the hysterectomy for some time instead she was being asked to just go ahead with chemotherapy and as it is this lady always had a fear and so she again tried to postpone chemotherapy 
in the fourth follow up after that usg report when she had come back so based on the changes with the usg report also carcinosin was being given again as a intercurrent medicine along with calcareacab because one dose in 15 days first dose was been if on the first day if calcareacab was given 15th day carcinosin was being given and hydrastis was being continued for this patient later after 6 months after the total 6 months the changes what was observed is the weight has been reduced slightly but the hemoglobin has slightly increased now it is not that this lady was having profuse bleeding and all so might be with a general health to be improved her hemoglobin level has been increased but important is the anxiety level has been reduced which was reported by her son her son said that that fear and that anxiety level has come down comparatively which the lady says that she still has that worry that fear there was no difference in what the lady was speaking about her personal feelings but the, the son said that her anxiety levels reduced basically because she was able to sleep better her sleep was going ahead for around 4 5 hours without disturbances and uh, that uh, fear though this lady used to speak in front of us the son was telling the elder son always said that she is comparatively better and little bit cheerful the important change what was noticed is the endometrium has come down the endometrial thickening and which was just 3 mm no fluid or mass in the pouch of the glass and on the recommendation of the oncologist only to see whether though the endometrium has reduced and because there is no spread that was the other concern which was supposed to be taken care of. and so they went ahead for ct scan which shows that there is no spread of malignancy based on the total of the observations along with the reports and as the lady was not willing for even chemotherapy alkiriacab was continued along with carcinosin 1m now because already <coughs> it was a long time and now we wanted to see a good change and hence we wanted to increase the, instead of trying to change the whole of the medicine only the potency was increased because the medicine had shown a better change so without disturbing the medicine only the potency was being changed up and after uh, along with that calcarea carb and carcinosin awareness is given uh, only to increase the general health of the person and be to say it was good or bad the patient is still continuing the medications even since just one month back though now personally the patient doesn't come and visit me this person this patient because she we know it directly and uh, like uh, every now and then she is in contact the medicines are being sent to her through her son her son comes and gets it collected now so this was the first case what was being put up and now moving to the second case <coughs> the second case is related to the ca cervix a patient of 54 years who was being diagnosed for ca cervix third stage and hence very little scope was there with us to go ahead for the treatment of this patient she was in a critical situation on the bed and she was advised for immediate pan hysterectomy so it was little bit difficult to handle these cases me and my colleague like we were thinking of what to go do and not to do but still then because this was actually this was a patient was one of the relative of my student and hence we said let us go ahead at least we'll see that something can be done for this patient on going ahead with uh, interrogations we saw that her menstrual cycles were regular but important is it was too heavy and this patient usually is to have acute colicky pains for two days every time the menstrual bleeding used to be there the menstrual discharge is always foul smelling dark clotted and the discharge is always more at night the menstrual discharge is but presently now she had a sensation of mass in the lower genital region and because of that sensation when she went and consulted her gynecologist a thorough checkup and investigations was being done and after the investigations she was being diagnosed for third day, third stage of ca cervix this patient apart from the ca cervix of the diagnosis basically she had uh, uh, this uh, that pay, uh, student of mine as i said it she had come and asked this only about what can be done to relieve that burning pain 
because this pain or what the lady was having in the lower genital region it was severe in intensity and this lady used to constantly scream cry roll on the bed she was unable to tolerate that pain for longer time like every 3 5 minutes she used to get the pain and she used to keep on screaming the only thing what she used to feel better is as the student of mine who had said it that only by passing warm water or giving a warm bath uh, that was to relieve the pain but because that that technique cannot be done every now and then so the student had spoken to us and then we thought let like, we can have a trial and just go ahead to see what can be done so if you see here the ncv and nch are not showing much of changes as it is in any of the regular malignancy conditions also there will be no much of changes been observed even the ca 125 which was been uh, got done by the gynecologist which shows just 27 units ml per ml though as such like in a routine condition because she is just above 50 years ca 125 will come to around 15 ml or 22 to 50 ml 22 to 15 units per ml that will be the recording what we know it but this patient is showing just 27 so 22 to 27 was not a big issue still then the lady was having third stage of ca cervix and hence we had to plan a faster only to see that she may be in a position to go ahead for the hysterectomy the appetite completely lost and the sleep is constantly disturbed she hardly sleeps for more than 2 hours whatever has been spoken it was too weak to think understand the commands like whatever you try to say she is not going to listen she is not going to understand what you want to do want to whatever you want to say it was difficult to handle this case because she was not responding it properly on examination tenderness was been found in the lower abdomen and dirty brownish discharge in the vagina this peronia was also been ex experienced here and the cervix directly showed about the distorted and eroded cervix palpation tried to give small oozing spots at around 7 o'clock at um, the other one was 9 o'clock position small spots started bleeding at these two points and that was the reason of trying to there might be that was the reason why the gynecologist had been asked for the hysterectomy now coming up is because of the severe burning pains only based on that part we had we said okay let the burning pains be reduced at the moment that was the main concern about this patient and so we go, uh, try to go ahead for giving creosote 30 every 2 hourly to reduce that burning pain along with creosote 32 uh, uh, every 2 hourly arsenic was been planned up just one do arsenic album was been given to plan up for only one dose and night the sun has reported there was no change at all in any way just because there was no change in any way we said instead of 30 let us first instead of changing the medicine we'll go ahead for creosote 200 increasing the potency was the first plan and repeating with the priosa 200 we saw that the next day the sun said patient slept for 5 hours that night without waking up at all that was the first good hope what we got and then the other point is the frequency of pains also reduced the previously what the pain was there coming up every 1 hour 2 hours now that pains have been reduced though the intensity was the same so for that reason just because we saw a good change with creosot creosot 200 was again been given but instead of every 2 hourly now we had planned up only for 6 hourly and again arsenic was been given up just one dose at that night the third follow up immediately after the second after two days what the uh, patient had <coughs> when i went to visit the patient i have seen that the frequency of the pain has been reduced and the patient is able to sleep for around 5 to 6 hours now because this patient was absolutely on bed it was difficult for this patient to come to the clinics every day i used to go there and visit this patient and after 3 days when i saw that this lady was able to sleep for around at least 5 to 6 hours that was a satisfactory change what i wanted because that screaming that shouting crying was not to be seen the other important point is the offensiveness has been reduced in the discharges though not the quantity and hence creosot was being continued again for next 8 days along with milefolium 
the reason of selecting millefolium is first thing is to stop the bleeding and the discharges of the uterus millefolium has got a better action on the uterine endometrial glands along with the capillaries of the uterus and that was the reason of selecting millefolium to stop the excessive discharges to stop the bleeding and so creosot along with millefolium was been given and this patient who had been who has actually been posted for hysterectomy after 15 days just before prior to the hysterectomy few days prior she was been again taken for the total of investigations where a better change was seen in her investigations for the initial part related to the blood examinations but the pelvic usg had shown the adhesions of pelvic lymph nodes this was a alarming condition for the uh, <coughs> oncologists and hence they planned to temporarily withheld the hysterectomy because adhesions are not good when the hysterectomy has to be planned and so they planned up is only to go for chemotherapy and radiotherapy the patient underwent chemotherapy but the bad thing is within 3 to 4 days after the first chemotherapy the patient succumbed to the as been spoken up by the oncologist which was not uh, like uh, easily acceptable for anybody but as been spoken by the oncologist it was been said the patient succumbed to the effects of chemotherapy and radiotherapy specifically because of her weaker body because the hemoglobin level was also less in this patient and that was the reason to see that there was no much of good change as for the total case to come up so coming to the conclusion totally now in the first case according to my observations i can put up that in general also the prognosis was good because we could see that her health in general improved and specifically also related only to the malignancy also we could see a good change as specifically spoken hemolysis has a action to reduce to gradually bring the death of the malignant cells though in homeopathy we haven't seen on this literature there are studies being done by the other system of medicine specifically when we speak with the complementary uh, medicines when we go ahead and search in those journals also you can just try to see that for your understandings but as uh, considering that part itself we have to think on all these rarer medicines or might be the uh, remedies has been taken for specific action when been considering hemolysis <coughs> sorry hydrostase has been selected only to reduce the number of malignant cells along with the basic constitutional remedy of calcarea carb in the second case the acute complaints naturally for what we had planned to handle the case naturally had shown a good change so for that reason creosot gave a good change no matter the good change was to reduce that burning pains that acute complaints what was there that screaming shouting that was the main concern for what we had planned up but because it was a stage 3 it was difficult to handle and because the patient is also not cooperating to get a complete details was also difficult to go ahead for this case but the only thing is now it is difficult to say that whether this lady had a good ending or a bad ending when we speak about specific situation related to malignancy whether the ending was good or bad is a question which has to be left up according to me i would say that at least that burning pains that pains what the usually what we have seen over the malignant patients that burning pains that screaming the intolerable pains and the death to uh, anticipation of death due to such conditions is very bad and that was the only good hope what we said that okay let the pains be reduced so with these two cases i end up my presentation as because the time was not much i didn't plan up to go ahead for the remaining cases so thank you all thank you ma'am once again for giving a opportunity to be among you people and make me highlight myself for at least two cases what was possible if at all we are able to get a better extra timing sense forth we may try to go ahead for a extra cases to be done within different areas thank you ma'am thank you all once again thank you dr kiran kumar for your wonderful presentation and today we have last speaker of today's webinar dr raisa cherian 
Dr. Raisa Cheryan graduated her BHMS and MD in the subject of Materia Medica from Father Mullah's Homeopathic Medical College in the year 2018. She got highest marks in the MD examination and awarded gold medal. She is hardworking and dedicated staff to my department. She has published articles in journals and she has taken up a research project which is going on in the topic of allergic rhinitis. Presently, she is working as an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Over to you, Dr. Raisa. Thank you, ma'am, and good afternoon, all. So in the last two sessions, you have heard about the investigations about, of the genital malignancies as well as certain clinical experiences regarding the genital malignancies, the management part. So in this session, uh, this is a short presentation regarding the breast cancer. So it is mainly the theoretical part, how to screen and how to diagnose. OK. So the theme of this presentation is that the early detection that ensures the better survival. So coming to the contents, the, I will be mainly dealing with the screening part, how to screen as well as the diagnosis and the important investigation. So coming to the diagnosis part, the investigation part, the investigations can be for the diagnosis as well as for the staging of the cancer as well as regarding the treatment approach. So the investigations mainly uh, focused on the diagnosis of the cervical cancer we will be discussing as well as how to screen a case lady presenting with. Okay. Uh, the females, okay, the, these are the parts we are going to discuss today. So coming to the importance or why this becomes a major problem now. So if you see the burden of CA breast nowadays. So see, so breast cancer, it is the second most commonest cancer in the world and it is the most common cancer among the women. Also, if you see, it's the leading cause of cancer-related death in the women. So even in India, if you see the current scenario, it is asserted it is the most common cancer in women in India also. Maybe before some 10 to 15 years, you might see the literature you have seen, the CA cervix was the commonest cancer. But nowadays, in the current uh, epidemiological or statistical data, you will find that CA breast has become the most common cancer in the women in India, especially in the urban areas. So the lifestyle, the living habits, all those things are changing and that will become the important factor that is de uh, deciding the increase in the rise of CA breast in India also. And one of the unfortunate fact is the mortality rate, okay, that is also higher in uh, India because the identification or detection of the CA breast cases may be later. So coming to the risk factors. So here I'll go directly to the risk factors and the common symptomatologies where you need to suspect CA breast and what are the investigation you have to go for. So coming to the risk factors, the geographical and racial factors, family history, menstrual and obstetrical history, okay? So all these things are there. Before that, I will tell something about the pathophysiology a little bit. I'll not go in detail regarding the histopathological classification or the staging of the CA breast, but just remember for the CA breast, there are two factors which is playing major role. That is the hormonal factors as well as the genetic factors. So genetic factors, you know, the um, mutations in the gene, that is the BRCA or the breast cancer gene, BRCA1 and 2, the mutations that is happening. So that is one of the important factor as well as the hormonal dependency, the estrogen receptors and the human epidermal growth factor uh, receptor hormone, okay? So these estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, so these hormones also play an important role in the growth and progression of the CA breast. So coming to the geographical and racial factors, so you know, in this picture, you can see the reddish areas, 
the northern americas the europe areas australia so they have the higher incidence of the ca breast okay maybe it is due to the lifestyle the food habits inactivity okay all those reasons can be attributed to it so again you have the family history especially if the first degree relative is affected with the ca breast especially mother sister or daughter so again the patient may have two to six fold uh, rise in the or higher risk in ca breast uh, developing ca breast as well as the menstrual history the higher the longer the duration of exposure to the estrogen the early menarche nulliparity late age of first childbirth as well as the delayed menopause so the endogenous and exogenous estrogen influence so that can also be a risk factor for the development of the carcinoma breast as well as certain benign changes that are there in the breast such as the epithelial a typical epithelial hyperplasia okay so that can be considered as a precursor for the carcinomatous changes there is a five fold higher uh, risk for these persons who are having the fibrocystic changes also so again there are certain factors which are mainly related to the lifestyle and the food habits diet and all so that includes the consumption of large amount of animal fat high calorie foods cigarette smoking alcohol consumption okay and exposure to ionizing radiation during the breast development so some radiation therapy or something is taken during the puberty or in the young adult stage that can also make uh, be a risk factor for the ca breast development in the later age okay then you have another factor that is a high breast density so what do you mean by high breast density so in the mammography or the x ray film when you see usually the breast is uh, consisting of the fatty tissue as well as the glands and the ducts so when the the fatty tissue that may appear more or less the translucent appearance and the connective tissue the glands and the ducts they appear the translucent or the opacity appearance so when these tissues are more it may tell as a high breast density okay so the people who are having the high breast density they may also say to have a higher risk for developing ca breast So idiopathogenesis. Okay, in short, I have told you the endogenous and exogenous estrogen influence because of the interplay between the high levels of circulating estrogen and the estrogen receptors and the growth factors that are present in the breast that may uh, bring about the progression of the breast cancer. So coming to the warning signs. So when the patient comes to the OPD and presenting with certain signs and symptoms. So when you have to suspect a case of CA breast. so you know the most common symptom of the ca breast it's a non tender lump in the breast mostly located in the upper and outer quadrant so when studying the examination of the breast you might have studied that there is a, a division of four quadrant the upper outer quadrant upper inner quadrant okay lower outer quadrant lower inner quadrant so the most common site is the upper and outer quadrant as well as the discharge the non milky nipple discharge especially if there is a bloody discharge then you have to be careful as well as there is a retraction of the nipple previously water nipple there is a change in the appearance of the nipple or a position as well as introing of the overlying skin then localized edema of the skin so you can see the picture the characteristic appearance which is called as the pd orange or the orange peel appearance because of the subcuticular lymphatic blockage that is leading to opening up of the sweat gland and the hair follicle pores are opening up leading giving rise to the orange peel appearance okay so as well as the persistent erosion or crusting of the nipple so if you see the classification of the ca breast you have the invasive carcinoma in situ carcinoma as well as the paget disease of the breast so paget disease of the breast there mainly the nipple area is involved with the eczematous lesions so that also you need to be aware of so coming to the advanced cases where there is metastasis happening so the metastasis of ca breast can happen to the bone lungs brain so liver also so the symptoms related to that can be present so such as the bone pain shortness of breast loss of appetite or weight loss always associated with the most of the malignancies so headache neurological pain and the weakness so these are some of the symptoms you can find in this condition okay so finishing with the symptomatology of the ca breast we will go forward towards the screening so whom to screen and how to screen so you are going to find out if any ca breast is developing in an asymptomatic patient so the screening of the ca breast or any methods has its own advantages and disadvantages 
So the benefit, as you know, if you are screening, the population is screened for certain disease condition. You can always be assured of the improved health outcome. You can easily detect the clinical condition in the early stages and treat better and better health outcomes will be there. But there are adverse consequences also. That is certain false positive results that will be giving rise to more anxiety, inconveniences, in over expenditure, over, over diagnosis and over treatment. All these side effects are also there. So for screening of the breast cancer, you have the certain methods that includes the breast self-examination, breast self-awareness, clinical breast examination, as well as the mammography. So these are some of the methods you use. So coming first, we'll go to the breast self-examination or the breast self-awareness. So before that, coming to the guidelines, uh, like there are different guidelines regarding the screening of the breast cancer. So one of the uh, guidelines is that, uh, first thing, the clinical breast examination as well as the mammography that can be used for the screening of the breast cancer. So clinical breast examination, when it can be advised as a routine for the women, that is annually for women at 40 years or older or every one to three years for women aged between 25 to 39 years. Okay, so that is the time you can advise the lady to go for a clinical breast examination. So when to start the mammography? Mammography initiation age is no later than 50 years. Okay, so you can offer the option of mammography to the woman at the age of 40 years and it should not be later than 50 years. So the mammography can be done in an interval of one or two years and it can be continued up to the age of 75 years. So after that, depending upon the health of the woman and the uh, life expectancy as well as the joint decision between the patient and the doctor, the continuation has to be decided. So this is one of the guidelines. Okay, if you search, there are different guidelines which is given more or less same with slight difference. Okay, so coming to the breast awareness. In the previous uh, years, if you search, there will be a information like um, self-breast examination that is given much importance. But nowadays, the studies that is not given much importance about the self-breast examination, but what they promote is the breast awareness. That is encouraging the lady to become more familiar with one's own breast so that she knows what is normal for her and any abnormality she will be able to diagnose is or identify easily and can approach the physician. Okay. So when to conduct the breast self-examination? So it is uh, told it can be done once uh, every month or once in two months. So it can be done monthly during the bath or the best time is just at the end of the menses. Oh, following the menses, it is done because it is told that during the menses or before the menstrual uh, menses time, most of the ladies, they may have the breast tenderness. So it is better to uh, do at the end of the menses. And also one more thing that you need to remember is fix the day, okay, uh, this many days after the menses or the lady is not menstruating, fix a particular day in the month and do at the same day. So that is the uh, instruction regarding the breast self-examination usually suggested to be done after 20 years of age. So it helps to keep in, uh, helps the lady to notice any irregularity or any lump in the breast. So the procedure, I think all of you are aware of. So in a gist, I will just mention, so you can tell the lady to stand in, the, in front of the mirror with arms at her side. So she can look for any changes in the breast, any abnormal swellings or a dimpling or puckering of the skin or any nipple discharge is present. So such things can be observed. So the position, different positions, the observation can be made. That is clasping the hand behind the head and looking for any change in the shape or contour of the breast as well as placing the hands on the hip. So again, the, any discharge in the breast, uh, from the nipple has to be observed. Also, the next stage for the palpation that is raising an arm and pressing with the fingers in their area of the breast, checking for any lumps. So when checking, the lady has to do it with palpation with the three fingers, especially the second, third, and fourth fingers, not used to, uh, not trying to uh, get hold of the mask between the fingers. She may get the false positive result. Okay. So repeating the steps in the shower and repeating the steps by lying down. So this is the method. We can advise the lady to go for the breast self-examination. So different methods of palpation in the up and down linear pattern or by the 
beds method or in the circular pattern the palpation can be done only thing make sure she covers the entire breast area so coming to the clinical breast examination so i will not go in detail but you know the important steps the four steps that is the inspection palpation examination of lymph nodes as well as the general examination i am going little faster so i hope you are understanding so the position of the examination it can be sitting lying down or bending forward so first is the inspection inspection of the breast the skin and the surrounding area nipple and the areola so all these things has to be inspected for any uh, swelling or any lump any ulceration or any skin changes the discolorations nipple discharges so all these things can be observed during the inspection so coming to the palpation again the entire breast area has to be palpated for any lump so then if any lump is felt so the examination of the lump has to be done so it is fixed to the skin or to the underlying fascia and the muscle so this palpation has to be done then coming to the examination of the lymph nodes so the axillary group of lymph nodes as well as the supraclavicular the cervical group of lymph nodes has to be examined so the general examination mainly help you to identify if there is any metastasis the liver lung or any other metastasis is there so that can also be identified during the general examination so i'm not going in detail about the clinical breast examination hope your third bhm students are familiar with it so coming to the investigation part the screening the third stage is the mammography so this is the most effective method for screening of the breast cancer for detection of a non palpable and minimally invasive breast cancer so always it gives a better result if it is combined with the clinical breast examination or the breast self examination so when you uh, one more thing is the uh, indication when you suggest for the mammography that is a age above 40 for the general population as well as the age of 25 to 30 years that is early if the lady is having a uh, brca1 carrier or she is having some relatives who are brca carriers also if she is um, having the family members who are having the breast cancer so then again we can offer the mammography at an earlier age okay so coming to the digital mammography so compared to the film mammography this can be better useful in women who are premenopausal or perimenopausal and those who are under the age of 50 and having a very dense breast tissue so coming to the reporting part you might have heard about the terminology birads okay like in the thyroid uh, reports you might have heard about tirads t a r a d s so in the breast imaging there is a terminology that is used that is the breast imaging reporting and data the scoring that is 0 to 6 which gives an idea about the uh, standardized reporting method where you have the scoring 0 to 6 so 0 is an incomplete where you are not able to make a proper report 1 is negative and 2 is benign and 3 is probably benign after 4 to 6 it is the malignant stages so you are entering into the gray zone uh, gray zone so in the sixth one it is already biopsy proven malignancy okay so regarding the Im imaging techniques we have the ultrasonography mri as well as the pet scan so ultrasonography you can offer to the young women who are pregnant and lactating uh, and the lactating ones so one problem here is that there is an inability to demonstrate the micro calcifications so as a routine you cannot advise for the population screening so it can be indicated or advice for the women who are having a breast lump developing during the pregnancy and lactation as well as those who are having a symptomatic breast lump in women aged less than 30 years as well as in case of breast inflammation also you can suggest for the ultrasonography so coming to the mri the screening with mammography plus breast mri so that is recommended when so it gives a better results when you are going for an age of 25 years um, above the age of 25 year in women with brca1 or braca2 mutation or a first degree relative with a braca1 or braca2 mutation or if the lady is having a strong family history that is two or more first degree relatives are having the breast cancer so in such condition it is always advisable to 
send her for a MRI report also. So if the lady is having also a personal history of invasive breast cancer, so this is another indication. So coming to the biopsy. So there is FNAC studies, coronal biopsy as well as the open biopsy. So FNAC studies, it is one of the important investigation which is cheap and simple procedure with no morbidity. So unfortunately, sometimes it can produce the false negative diagnosis and it cannot differentiate a non-invasive carcinoma with the invasive one. So core needle biopsy, it is, uh, gives a much uh, accurate result and specific result in confirming the malignancy. So CNB can uh, diagnose the invasive cancer. So next coming to the open biopsy, you have the excisional biopsy as well as the incisional biopsy. So which can be done as a primary procedure or when the result of the FNAC is inconclusive, you can opt for the open biopsy. So this is regarding the investigation part. So next what I am coming is to is the two cases, okay? Two cases is how we have done the diagnosis. The lady is coming to the OPD with certain breast lump or certain breast pathology. So how with the clinical examination and investigation you come to the diagnosis part. So these cases are not malignancy cases. So first only I'll tell you. So the purpose of showing this case is mainly to identify the process of diagnosis. So before coming to that, I'll mention something about the triple test. So that includes three stages, which will give you a better accurate diagnosis. That is, you have to depend upon the clinical examination, breast imaging, and histopathology. Okay. So these things combined together, the triple test gives a more accurate test. All women with a breast lump, it is better if she undergo a triple test comprising of clinical breast examination, breast imaging, either mammogram or ultrasound or MRI or the histopathological studies okay, using the FNAC or core biopsy. So this is a simple case. I think you are able to diagnose it very easily. So the patient of 35 year old female coming with a lump in the bilateral mammary gland since six years, occasional pain, mostly painless. The pain is during the menses or on pressure. There is no discharge and there is no nipple changes, no skin changes, and there is no lymphadenopathy. Only thing she is anxious because she is heard about, uh, heard from some other relatives that somebody is developing breast cancer and all. She is anxious about her condition. So inspection, there is no redness, there is no visible um, abnormalities on the breast, but only on palpation, you can feel a smooth, hard, mobile lump. So what will be the diagnosis? So the diagnosis, we are suspecting of fibroadenoma of breast, so you can send her for the ESG of breast, which is confirming your diagnosis, a well-defined hypoechoic lesion in the both breast, suggestive of fibroadenoma. So if you are curious about the case, the case is progressing with the remedy phytolaca. So coming to the second case, again a 34-year-old female coming to the OPD. So it, it is a case uh, treated by our department, ma'am. So on 30th, 13 for 2020, the patient has presented with a swelling in the right, uh, right breast since September 2019. She is having pain as well as hardness, aggravated during menses, there is no discharge. So a lump is felt on the examination. So she had these two reports on arrival on 10-9-2019 that is having the mastitis with well-defined lesions that is inflammatory mass as well as fibroadenoma. And the FNAC reports also she had that thing that shows organized separate mastitis. So after treatment, the, after the first prescription, again, she is coming for the follow-up. Okay, I'm not uh, telling about the management, the remedy part. So the lump opened up oozing of pus, but the size of the lump that is reduced and the pain is better. So again, she has underwent the investigations, okay, which is showing the retroalveolar abscess as well as the fibroadenoma in the reports. So again, the follow, okay, the patient improved in the Silesia calcarea self and other remedies, the breast abscess. So again, one more follow-up I'm showing here because the pinching and shooting pain in the left breast had intraded swelling, greenish appearance. Okay, there is no discharge, occasional itching. So one more is the investigation report. What you have here is the ductal ecstasia with thick debris in the right breast fibroadenoma as well as mastitis. So FNAC is also done in this case. So where 
to organize separating breast abscess is the diagnosis that is made. Okay. So with that, I'll end regarding the diagnosis part. So I think some questions are asked or I can hand it over to ma'am. She can present a case of CA breast. No? I think it is, uh, time is up. Yeah. I, I think, think the time, time is up, up otherwise I have, I have two cases, cases of, of cancer, cancer of the, the breast. breast. It is a very good case. Sir. What to do? We'll continue. Time yeah, it's time. time. Now, now we, we have, have come to the conclusion of today's webinar presentation. If you have any questions or queries, you can send to mail or through WhatsApp messages. Before concluding, first and foremost, I would like to thank today's resource persons, Dr. Joe Snorona, Dr. Kiran Kamar, and Dr. Raisa Cherian for your wonderful presentation. I would like to thank all the students, PGs, interns, staff, and practitioners who attended this webinar. My special thanks to all the HODs of the OBG department of all colleges who supported me to organize this webinar. I also thank our administrator, principal, and all the faculty members for their support and guidance to organize this webinar. Once again, thank you all. <laughs>